we are still waiting for our chief guest. But uh, we are ready to begin. And first and foremost, I welcome all of you on behalf of the three affiliates, the three new affiliates of Creative Commons in India, Achar Narendev College, University of Delhi, Center for Internet and Society based at Bangalore, and Wikimedia India, again based at Bangalore, but their representative is in Bombay. I'd like to welcome all of you who took your time out to come here. And uh, you can see this is a relaunch. And many of people raise this question, why are you calling it a relaunch? Or why are you calling it a launch at all? And I think the best person to answer this question is Lawrence. And is he around? OK. So uh, I'm going to, I'm grateful to Lawrence Liang and Shishi Jha and IIT Bombay for initially setting up the CC India in 2007. It was actually in, uh, launched on January 26, 2007. Isn't it? Yeah. Did I say 11? OK. And, uh, and they were responsible for getting the India versions of the CC licenses going. And uh, the present team of Achar Narendra College, Wikimedia India, and Center for Internet and Society will continue, I hope, to be guided by both Lawrence and Sheshe. And now I invite Lawrence to come and inform us about how CC India took off and where we are today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let me just uh, ask Anuradha to welcome Lawrence with a I don't believe in giving bouquets, but I do believe in giving small potted plants. Okay. Thanks for the introduction and welcome everyone. Um, I think it's a very timely and a perfect gift to get because it kind of immediately makes the presentation slightly more aesthetic. And since all of you have been waiting here for the last you know, 20 odd minutes or so, let me make up your impatience with a little story before I begin to talk about Creative Commons. Because in some ways it kind of contextualizes the emergence of Creative Commons and why it became such an important kind of a movement globally. But the story goes back a little long way. In 1942, Hollywood had its kind of sleeper hit, and this was uh, Casablanca. Casablanca, as you know, had Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman, and it's known as this kind of great cult classic for no apparent reasons apart from the fact that it had dialogues like, you know, is that the sound of your heartbeat or a bomb going off, etc. And still it became a major hit. But in 1942, when the movie came out, it became hugely popular, and three years later, the Marx Brothers decided to bring out a movie called A Night in Casablanca. Now, Groucho Marx received a legal notice from the lawyers at Warner Brothers claiming that he was in violation of their copyright because he couldn't use the word Casablanca. Groucho Marx sent a reply back, which I think in some ways set the tone for the battle that would emerge over the next 20 to 30 years, but with, without much of the humor, in which he said, thanks for letting me know that you know, you're the owner of the copyright in Casablanca because I didn't know anyone could own copyright in the word Casablanca. But now that I know, I'll be a little careful about this, but let me tell you one thing. If I am in violation of your right in the word Casablanca, then you're in violation of my right in the word brothers. Because the Marx brothers have been br brothers for much longer than the Warner brothers have been brothers. In fact, the Warner brothers are not really brothers because one of them is merely a cousin. And if you're not in violation of our rights, then clearly you're in violation of the rights of the Grimm brothers, the brothers Karamazov, and the brothers from Oh Brother, Can You Lend Me a Dime? Uh, but one of them died, so there's only one brother left in, in that. Groucho Marx surprisingly never got a reply from the lawyer at Warner Brothers. 
But this idea in some ways of the kind of permission culture that emerged, especially in the last 20 years, is what necessitated the Creative Commons. If you were to imagine the way that our relationship to the question of knowledge and to the idea of cultural production has been throughout history, it's always been premised on the idea that knowledge is not like a piece of land or a car or a pen that you own. That the idea of knowledge is an accumulative one, that knowledge can only build in some ways on practices of sharing. So in some ways, the entire domain of intellectual property laws, and especially copyright, was a narrow exception to the general rule that all forms of knowledge and culture are and should be in the public domain. But as knowledge became increasingly commercialized, and as it became corporatized, you started having the spread of intellectual property laws and copyright extending much beyond its initial domain. And in some ways, the crisis was most acutely felt in the West. So in the United States, for example, and this is an interesting irony, because copyright was restricted in a number of ways, and one of them was the term of copyright. So if copyright is about the creation of incentives for authors to create, how do you create that incentive? By providing them a limited mono monopoly so that they can re recuperate some earnings based on their works. But if you look at the history of the way that copyright began to extend in the US, the initial term of copyright when it began was for 14 years. After you write a book for 14 years, you have exclusive rights on this. But this begins to spread over and over again. And by the time we come to the 60s, there is one character responsible for the spread and the extension of copyright term, and that character is Mickey Mouse. When the term of copyright in Mickey Mouse came to an end, you can imagine how valuable a commodity Mickey Mouse was. Disney Corporation begins to lobby Congress to extend the term of copyright. It comes to an end again, despite the first extension, in the 90s, and there is yet another attempt to extend the term of copyright. At this point of time, there is an increasing awareness based on inspirations from the open source movement, etc., about what the alternatives should be to protect the public domain. And here, Professor Lawrence Lessig, who was at that point of time teaching law at Harvard, decides to challenge the validity of this extension of copyright in the US. And he stages a constitutional challenge based on the First Amendment, saying that the extension of, co of copyright in this manner will result in the violation of A, my right to information, B, my right to freedom of speech and expression. The Supreme Court hears the challenge, but decides against Lessig. So Lessig decides at that point of time that if we do not have the law already on our side in terms of a slightly more balanced law, then what kind of legal alternative can we create? And that really is when Creative Commons was launched. Now, as many jurisdictions, as people interested in the entire question of access to knowledge and access to culture in India, we were also a part of the launching of the Creative Commons in India, as you know, in 2007 at IIT Bombay. So what happened? Why is there a relaunch and why is it important, in a way, for a movement like CC to constantly reinvigorate itself? I think the biggest change that has happened is that when we launched Creative Commons in 2007, we didn't launch a movement we launched a license. We had basically created the Indian version of the CC license, and that was what was launched. But clearly, in the period between 2007 to now, there is a much wider community, a much larger set of people who have been using the license, can demonstrate its efficacy in terms of how the advantages of using a CC license over others, etc., have been. So what we now have, in some senses, is a really robust, vibrant community that can actually take the project further. The second problem was that when the CC was launched in the US, there was already a crisis. A large number of people had been facing various kinds of restrictions on their ability to use and reuse culture because of very strong and strict copyright norms. So for example, if you looked at the entire domain of hip hop music, hip hop music is created through the incorporation of existing music and transforming it. But hip hop had already seen a decline in terms of the complexity of music that was being produced as a result of stronger copyright norms being enforced. In India, where copyright has largely been interpreted, and I would say accurately so, as the right to copy, 
we didn't have this problem. So you didn't have a situation in which a number of people were prevented from doing things because of strong copyright norms. That was one kind of a problem. So the, the urgency of having to incorporate or, or, or to look at a movement like CC didn't exist. The second issue was that a large number of the movements in the, in the global West focused or tended to focus on creative practitioners. In India, one of the biggest issues is access to learning materials, which I'll speak a little bit about you know, in, in, in a bit. But we didn't focus on access to learning materials when we launched Creative Commons. So in some ways, Creative Commons was still very much in the domain of the metropolises. It didn't speak to the concerns of a large number of people living in India. And I feel that the second phase that we're looking at, it's crucial to address both of them simultaneously and not exclude one at, you know, at the cost of the other. And the third reason, which I think the most important to my mind, uh, for needing a Creative Commons relaunch is very simply something called YouTube. Post YouTube, what has happened is a large number of people don't see themselves as passive consumers of music videos or of music any longer. The kind of creative reuse of existing material that you see on YouTube has really ch converted the idea of who a user in the digital sphere is. Earlier, the distinction between a consumer and a user was a very clear one. Now we have a new category, and we have a new subject of creativity that has emerged, and that really is the idea of the prosumer, the producer and consumer simultaneously. So what has happened with YouTube is that the number of people who are able to use existing material, but then suddenly find overnight that their video has been taken down because it is an alleged infringement of someone's copyright. All of these together, I think, makes us an interesting moment about how we think about the importance of kind of revitalizing something like the Creative Commons in India. And I'm very happy that this is now, in a way, kind of pluralized. Earlier, we only had Shishir at IIT, and I was in Bangalore as the project lead and the legal lead. But now we have a large number of other institutions, and hopefully this will just spread in a way. The entire premise of the Creative Commons, which is itself in some ways based on the free software movement, is that knowledge production and culture production is viral. It's contagious. It has to be. So hopefully with this relaunch of the Creative Commons, we will see the Creative Commons going into a viral phase in the Indian context. Thanks again for all of you, you know, for, for, for being here. Uh, <clears throat> Sunil. Yeah, okay. So maybe I, I was supposed to address the question of access to education, but maybe I'll do that later if we have the time, right? So thanks. I think we'll request uh, Lawrence to give the talk. I mean, I, I actually called him up and asked him to explain why the launch and the relaunch, etc. So now we, I'd like to request him to talk on Creative Commons and the open access to scholarly journals. He will give his formal talk now. I feel like this is, you know, my own relaunch again. So. <laughs> <coughs> So I, I spoke about how Creative Commons was uh, kind of hosted in IIT Bombay. And one of the largest open educational resources project, which is, you know, you look at the number of people who want to get into IIT and the number of people who don't get into IIT. So the question is, an institution of that quality, what are the ways in which you can make your learning material available to a much wider set of people across India? So a major open educational resource project called the Ekalavya project was launched in IIT Bombay, which basically videographed all of the lectures that were taking place in the classrooms and made available to everyone for free to watch and free to download, so that the quality of the professors at IIT was not restricted to a small number of students. But I want to pick up on this name. Why was it called the Ekalavya Project? Because all of us know the Ekalavya story. To my mind, the Ekalavya story is the first instance of the sharp lines, battle lines that are drawn between people who have knowledge and people who are denied access to knowledge. And what are the ways in which people who are denied access to knowledge find their ways back, in a way, into the knowledge economy? Ekel Avir was the first person to create a pirated copy as learning material. He created a pirated copy of Dronacharya, and he learned with that. 
And the punishment, of course, was a very severe one. The punishment was Ekavalavya had to give his thumb as Guru Dakshina to Dronacharya. This relationship between curiosity and a desire in a way, an unbounded desire for knowledge <clears throat> and punishment has had a long history. And it's one that unfortunately repeats itself over and over again. So if one were to think, for example, earlier this year in January 2013, a young man, extremely brilliant and extremely talented, called Aaron Schwartz, committed suicide in January. And the reason that he committed suicide was there were a string of legal cases that he was facing uh, with the possibility of having to pay a huge fine to the tune of $30 million. And the reason that he had to pay this fine was Aaron Schwartz had basically plugged his computer into the MIT network and had downloaded So Aaron Schwartz had basically plugged his computer into the MIT network and downloaded a large number of articles, 30 million articles that he wanted to make available online for free to users. Aaron Schwartz, to my mind, is the first martyr of the information movement. Now, why was he doing this? Very simple reason. He felt that it was a very unfair system that a large number of people in the world did not have access to extremely expensive databases that were all locked up both by copyright and by digital technologies, and that this global inequity in terms of access to knowledge was something that he was intervening in. And to give you a, uh, an, an, an example of the seriousness of the problem, Harvard in 2012 announced that they were going to have a major cutback in the number of journal subscriptions that the Harvard Library had access to. The reason for that was that they were paying approximately $3.5 million a year with an inflation rate of 122% for access to electronic databases. Now, if you're talking about the richest university in the world facing a crisis of access to learning materials, what happens to countries which do not have universities like Harvard or do not have the resources like Harvard? How do you imagine, in a way, the crisis that afflicts ordinary universities? And to give you one example, the Kenyan Medical Research Institute, which is the leading medical research institute in, 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 in Kenya, has access to five journals a year, right? They started off with like 30 odd journals but have cut down every year because the cost of access to journals is unsustainable any longer. Prices for online access to articles have increased every year at 145% and some journals cost as much as $40,000 to access them. Robert Danton, who's an eminent historian and also the librarian at Harvard, note in an, in noted in his call for a move towards open access that we faculty do the research, we write the papers, we referee the papers by other researchers, we serve on editorial boards and all of this for free. And then we buy back the results of our labor at outrageous prices. In other words, what you have is a situation that much of the knowledge that is produced in the academic world is underwritten by public money. So all of these labors are contributed for free. If you look at the entire practice of journals and peer reviews, peer review is never paid for. If you were to actually monetize the amount of labor that goes into peer review, it comes to an insane $1.4 billion a year. And yet all of this knowledge is then converted into absolute property and guarded by extremely strong copyright and technological locks. Tim Gowers, who's the recipient of the Fields Medal in Mathematics, started a campaign called The Cost of Knowledge, urging academics to protest against the exploitation of these kind of, of this large scale. And more than 14,000 academics have already joined in some ways in a boycott of Elsevier and committed to moving towards open access journals. Let's translate this problem across countries. If you were to look, for example, at the cost of learning materials uh, in terms of developing countries, and here is a simple index. If you just do the, a simple test of looking at the comparative purchasing power across different countries, the costs of books measured across p against per capita income shows you something very interesting. Take one book by Amitav Ghosh. Now let's assume that the book is priced at $10 or 600 rupees. In India, taking the GDP per capita, which is approximately $1,400 or so, what you're looking at would be approximately 1% of the GDP per capita. Now, assuming that someone was spending the equivalent amount in the US, what is it that they would have to pay 
for a book. You translate it, and they would have to pay $480 for a copy of Amitav Ghosh. So if you look at this entire idea of the comparative purchasing power when it comes to access to learning materials, it translates itself most severely when you look at access to academic material and to scholarly material. There is an ongoing case in the Delhi High Court at the moment, which has been filed by the leading publishers, Oxford, Rutledge, Cambridge, etc., against Delhi University in a small photocopy shop called Rameshwari Photocopy Shop, in which it is alleged that the photocopying of chapters or extracts of a book is in violation of the copyright of the owners of the copyright. Now, one could get into the legality of this, which is severely contested, because the Indian Copyright Act has one of the most amazing set of exceptions for education, and Section 52I of the Copyright Act allows for the reproduction of materials in the course of education. But here is the statistic. Taking just one course, MA Sociology and one subject under that, Sociological Methods, 20 books prescribed for Sociological Methods, out of which two are not available because they are out of print. The cost of the 18 books together, 80,000 rupees. So how do you respond to this? One of the responses has been, of course, by the design of the Copyright Act. The Copyright Act is supposed to be a system of balances between, on the one hand, provision of incentives to creators, but equally a commitment to the idea of the dissemination of public knowledge. The second kind of an alternative that we have is really the idea of what the Creative Commons is about. How do you ensure public intellectual property for public money? The ideal of the university in a Kantian sense was committed to two kinds of freedoms. Academic freedom on the one hand, and the other one was freedom from knowledge being commercialized or being made into property. And I think it is towards this idea that one has to locate the entire practice of academic work itself. If you look at the way that you describe a writer or an academic, you always talk about them as being extremely gifted. What is it about the nature of the gift and the gift economy that automatically lends itself into an alternative ethical imagination of what our relationship to knowledge ought to be. Simon Magus, also known as Simon the Sorcerer, bequeathed his name to posterity when he offered to pay Jesus' disciples, Peter and John, a sum of money in exchange for the power to transmit the Holy Spirit. The idea of simony, which emerged from his name, refers in a way to the prohibited act of buying and selling sacred privileges a concept which by medieval Christianity extended to the domain of knowledge where a Latin maxim held, Scienta donum die es unse ven non potes. Knowledge is a gift of God, therefore it cannot be sold. Let me end by saying that if one were to draw the distinction between the way that intellectual property imagines our ownership of knowledge and how something like the Creative Commons imagines it, it would be this. If you take the idea of ownership at the core of this, there are two ways of thinking about ownership. One of it is in terms of exclusion. I own something, and hence I can exclude you from using it. The second is the ethical import of what it means to think of ownership. What does it mean to claim someone as your own? Right? What does it mean to say that my brother is my own? It is a relationship, in other words, of a certain kind of responsibility rather than one of exclusion alone. And it's interesting that the word own and the word owe come from the same etymological roots. Both of them are grounded in a certain idea of the normative, of the idea of the ought. But if copyright is really imagined around the idea of what it means to own the future, the Creative Commons is grounded on the idea of what it may owe, mean to owe to the future. Because if you begin to privatize the domain of knowledge, the possibility of creative or knowledge production in the future is really what gets threatened. The public domain is like a well of creativity that we all commonly share. And there is a danger if this well is poisoned, if it is in, or if it is fenced too much. And coming from a country where we know that the battles around access to wells and public infrastructure is strong, this is something that we relate to almost automatically. I began with the idea of Ekalavya, and Ekalavya being in the, in the first kind of, you know, pirator of, of knowledge. Ekalavya may have cut his thumb, you know, thousands of years ago, but there's still large numbers of people who are still bleeding by not having access to knowledge. So thanks for the patient listening, and I hope that we begin to use Creative Commons to ensure a much more equitable knowledge and information ecology. Thanks. <clears throat> Uh, thank, thanks, Lawrence.
And may I request Kanika to give him a small gift on behalf of the three organizations here? I'm very grateful that the Honorable Minister, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, was able to join us well in time. <laughs> and I believe it's a communication gap that resulted in him coming late. That Shashi Tharoor is here is very good because he's one of the people who has shown that he believes in open education resources. He believes in the Creative Commons license. He was responsible for the National Resource and OER platform being launched as a, this is a platform of NCRT materials and, and it has been launched to spread the school educational content on an open platform under a CC by SA license. And I know it's a tough job because I've been working with NCRT for last uh, more than 10 years and trying to talk them into it, but it was, it had to come from the top. And I'm glad that he could do it. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to, without much ado, I'd like to request him to come on stage. And uh, Moksh, Pranav, Somyan, please join us. And we'd like you to light the lamp. Uh, Sunil, where is Sunil? Sunil Abraham? Yeah. So basically, uh, Minister, we are the three organizations that represent uh, Wikimedia, uh, we, uh, the Creative Commons India now. Sunil represents CIS. Uh, these three people represent uh, Wikimedia. Three Wikimedia India, and I represent uh, Achar Narendev College, Delhi University. Can you bring the candle? So we'd like you to light. <laughs> Can I have the screen down, please? That's you, but where's the remote? Remote, TJ? No, we can, we can click it on the back. No, you need to launch this. Where's the remote? This is not even connected. Yeah. One second. Uh, we are going to ask you to press a button. I realize that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't mind pressing it on the mouse, but you don't need a remote for that. As long as I don't know what to press. Where to press? Where to press? No, this is getting the remote. Because you're just... Everything got disconnected and yeah. things. Right. Okay, you know what? Okay. I think you just if you can just launch the browser, Safari, yeah. Safari. No, Safari is that. I'm sorry, this one. No, no, no. Chrome. Chrome. You want the Chrome? Why is it? Which is the button now? Light button. 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 Uh, the creative commons dot org dot in the india page of the creative commons this is of course a work in progress and we'll have to work on it a lot this has just been put together a few days back thank you very much so now should I say a few words or? yeah not a few words <laughs> and now uh, dr shashi tharoor he will speak on initiatives of mhrd around openly licensed content and I'm sure we are all eager to know what the government thinks on this. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Savitri. And really, I want to add a word of appreciation to Lawrence Leung for that wonderful uh, 
an eloquent exposition of his point of view on this, on this whole issue. It was very interesting. And I, I have to tell you that when I wrote the great Indian novel, I reinvented the Ekalavya story. And in my version, he doesn't give up his thumb, uh, which I think was the morally right thing to have happened. But of course, we know what happened in the, in the great story. And I'm glad you evoked that tale. It's uh, delightful to have had a chance to, um, to be part of the Creative Commons launch in India. I have been an active supporter of the Creative Commons license globally, and I'm very glad to see it launching in India. Its advantages are well known, as the Creative Commons folks say it. In simple words, Creative Commons helps you share your knowledge and creativity with the world. Of course, I address you here today not only as a minister in the government of India, but also as an author who wishes to connect more directly and more widely with readers in ever greater numbers. I'm glad that with this significant initiative, Indians will also be able to share their creativity and knowledge more easily with the global audience. The world, too, will, I think, benefit from the exuberant energies of the native genius of India. Now, I've always believed that we can bridge the educational divide and the other socioeconomic fault lines that are the source of so much anxiety and unrest in our society by properly sharing and harnessing the potential of information and communication technology. Uh, ICT is, is important, and certainly it's important in this area uh, from my ministry's point of view. And I would certainly hope that today's launch is, is backed by significant efforts to raise awareness about Creative Commons and that individuals and institutions are in ever greater numbers are able to leverage the full potential of a Creative Commons. In a little over 10 years of existence, uh, Creative Commons has transformed the way we think about the creation and dissemination of knowledge and the role of the copyright regime in such activities. And I mention ICT because the creation of the internet in the 1990s provided us with the technological means to build a globally connected and accessible repository of human knowledge. <coughs> and it was complemented by the Creative Commons movement, which attempts to provide us with a legal and intellectual framework that really in many ways will give us a chance to realize the full potential of the internet. If the physical networks, the optic fiber cable, the, 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 the um, optic fiber cables, the routers, the data centers that span the globe carrying terabytes of data every day are the arteries and veins of the internet, the Creative Commons movement attempts to provide a heart and soul based perhaps on an abiding faith, we hope not misplaced, in the better angels of human nature. It's hardly surprising that in a little over 10 years, to give you one example, there are more than several hundred million Creative Commons licenses issued thus far on the popular website Flickr alone. <coughs> Wikipedia, of course, the online encyclopedia, has redefined the collection and sharing of knowledge and information, and it's itself based on a Creative Commons license. Uh, every time we, we make a contribution to Wikimedia, we are licensing it for free reproduction and use. Um, this is clearly an idea whose time has come in the Internet era, and we in India must Im understand and embrace it with our characteristic enthusiasm and innovativeness. I also believe that in today's technologically advanced world, we need more open educational resources. I'm very grateful that Sabitri mentioned my involvement in that area already. The term open educational resources was, uh, was coined at UNESCO's 2002 forum on open courseware and designates, and I quote UNESCO here, teaching, learning, and research materials in any medium, digital or otherwise, that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open license that permits no-cost access, use, adaptation, and redistribution by others with no or limited restrictions. Open licensing is built within the existing framework of intellectual property rights as defined by relevant international conventions and respects the authorship of the work." Unquote. OERs allow learning in any subject or topic. They also help leverage the resources available globally and subject to the availability of an internet connection, of course, OER opens doors of learning across all strata of society. Emerging from the initial OER movement, massive open online courses, or MOOCs, which have taken the US by storm, present exciting opportunities for us in India. The government of India has a similar initiative, the National Mission on Education through ICT, wherein all the services for students are available free on the content portal 
Sakshat. If MOOCs such as Coursera can teach first year Wharton MBA courses to a student studying in a local university in any part of the world, in India too we could expand our learning to those with very little access to quality education. The Ministry of Human Resource Development, my ministry, MHRD, started this national mission uh, with, with this very much in mind. You know, why can't a student sitting in Gorakhpur or Jhasi have access to the same sort of information that you can get in Wharton, or for that matter, in Delhi? It was only this August, less than three months ago, that our Honorable uh, HRM, as we call him, the Union Minister for HRD, Pallam Raju, and I launched the National Repository of Open Education Resources. And now, of course, I'm part of this launch ceremony today. This uh, rapid succession of launches brings in many ways to light the great technologically connected future that lies ahead of us. Uh, MHRD recognizes that India's education sector can benefit immensely from the change environment that we're talking about today. With OERs, the education sector can challenge what uh, my friend Pratap Hanu Mehta calls a traditional administrative setup in our country. To paraphrase his description, our systems in India are characterized by three features, hierarchy, secrecy, and discretion. Those are the, the, uh, the mantras of governance. Our education system, unfortunately, is also somewhat prone to these features, as perhaps are other aspects of our society. And I would hope that the Creative Commons movement in conjunction with our efforts to build up open education resources, will do more to shake up the somewhat fossilized systems and mindsets in our government system and through that in our higher education system. Openly licensed content surpasses all these traditional features and of course empowers India's students. The launch of the NROER, the Open Educational Resources uh, National Repository, is a significant step in this direction. NROER will help us reach the unreached and include the excluded. The NROER aims to offer resources for all school subjects and grades in multiple Indian languages. The resources will be available in the form of concept maps, videos, audio clips, talking books, multimedia, learning objects, photographs, diagrams, charts, articles, wiki pages and textbooks. And MHRD has been actively engaging with various organizations to propagate education for all. So NROER has become India's flagship initiative on, on open education resources and of course it incorporates ICT in education. It will help us to realize the goals of both the national education policy and the national curriculum framework. Over time, these initiatives will not only change the way we impart education in India, but will greatly impact how children will learn and how they will exchange ideas. It will open doors for new ways of interactive learning for students and we hope indeed for teachers. But this comes with an underlying caveat that in order to use this tool, students need to have free and open access to educational resources. Now I want to stress I'm not questioning the value of teachers in the process, the importance of human interaction, the significance of personalized teaching. But MHRD and I personally believe that ICT can aid a teacher and can help surely make the um, student-teacher relationships more interactive. And we can absorb ICT tools in teaching um, uh, and, and have students um, um, using interactive technologies, we will really have a tremendous amount of, uh, of, of, of progress. Uh, imagine seeing, for example, a video, uh, an openly available video that um, brings history to life, that makes the past vividly real, and not just a dry compilation of events and dates. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that, that, that could have been done some years ago. The use of audio and video uh, simply makes learning easier for children, enhances the way in which they learn. Uh, and technology, of course, has been move, moving more rapidly than files move in our ministry. Uh, so though the first initiative was launched by our ministry in 2004 and revised in 2010, we still need to set up quick reaction mechanisms to consistently monitor and evaluate the usage of ICT in our curriculum. Another factor that we should keep in mind while we employ greater ICT in education is to devise ways to measure the value addition of ICT in our educational system and the return on our investment in ICT. We need to consistently evaluate and monitor these aspects. We shouldn't just focus on assimilating and studying data pertaining to physical reach of ICT. Instead, we should also lay emphasis on the differential impact that ICT has on students' learning 
on the quality of content, maybe the indicators in which we evaluate the student's performance. In the absence of ICT, we've had largely static indicators to measure a student's performance, but the way technology is evolving and the new avenues of learning that ICT provides, we might have to progress to identifying new parameters by which we can evaluate a student's performance. The introduction of ICT in India's education policy is a key step in realizing the dream of inclusive education. In fact, despite 66 years of effort, India has not been able to provide access to schools uh, across the country to all our students. We've also suffered considerable challenges, as you know, in limiting the dropout ratio. <coughs> <coughs> Children have been dropping. Is there any water around? Really? No? Children have been um, dropping out to work, support their families, uh, perform household chores, sibling care. Boys and girls uh, have been dropping out. Thank you so much. The adequate, um, the question of infrastructure for students, the parity in teaching methods, the access to uh, similar material across the nation, the challenge of schools penetration in conflict-ridden districts, the issue of utilization of physical infrastructure in difficult terrain and harsh weather conditions are just some of the key issues that plague the Indian education system. ICT in education can be an answer to such maladies to a significant extent, will give easier access to the same teaching material to all students in India in languages of their choice through the Creative Commons approach. However, we also know that connectivity is the key to this form of education. The government has launched a 20,000 crore rupee project that will take high-speed broadband cables to 250,000, a quarter of a million villages across, in <coughs> across India, facilitating e-services in diverse fields, including education. This will bring, we hope, e-governance to our villages. The idea is to connect the Indian villager to the global village, and it will bring millions of Indians to information that can make a difference in their lives. And imagine how a young child's life can be transformed through education, reaching her from diverse quarters she wouldn't normally have access to, giving her the power to take advantage of the knowledge that the world has to offer her through the Internet and thanks to Creative Commons approaches. This child can probably teach her parents about the latest technologies in agriculture, for all we know, make the family understand the value of e-commerce, encourage them to have access to government services without being harassed by middlemen, the democratic dissemination of ideas and pedagogic practices through the use of ICT in schools will make every Indian far more conscious of his rights and far better equipped to exercise them. This will undoubtedly change our country for the better. Just as information technology has empowered the urban middle class in the last few years, and we know that some are trying to take political advantage of that, uh, that new internet-empowered urban middle class, uh, we can actually replicate the same model across the country with greater outreach to our rural areas once we have all our villages connected by broadband. And, of course, once we have education available uh, through this method. I should mention, actually, here that contrary to media reports that MHRD has given up on the Akash tablet project, we actually do believe that affordable tablets can make a difference to learning outcomes, and, and we do believe that if we can get... Uh, enhance portability and connectivity into the most remote villages, uh, then the research that's going on right now to create a tablet with a processor that will be as powerful as a first-generation iPad, uh, which comes with more random access memory than that one did, a USB port, a touch screen, um, and so on, we will actually be able to transform uh, educational opportunities for poor kids in our country. Uh, there have been issues with the timely delivery of Akash, these are in many ways teething troubles. Uh, we're certainly hopeful that, um, that the government will be in a position to announce standards that many manufacturers can produce, not just one, and that uh, we'll then see inexpensive mass-produced tablets emerging as a key force multiplier in the delivery of education. So that, again, we talk about creative commons, internet, material being available, but we need to give kids something in their hands through which they can access this material. Now, with ICT becoming part of the curriculum in schools, especially in our Kendra Vidyales or KVs, we're bringing our students closer to the larger world, <clears throat> allowing them to understand that their potential and their dreams are not limited to the immediate radius of their villages, towns, or cities. In fact, uh, KVs have been able to bring down the 
pupil to PC ratio, that is the number of students per personal computer in the schools, from 53 students per computer in 2005 to 22 per computer in June this year. Still a lot of people crowding around for one computer, but you can stagger the classes through the day and get them access. ICT will help us modernize our educational technology, bring it at par with the world, and allow us to offer our students education which goes beyond textbooks and beyond the traditional. The possibilities through ICT in our schools are endless, and we will benefit enormously. We can tap its potential right now to increase the choices available to our students. Opening access to all requires a debate on the issue of ownership, copyright, licensing, and a balancing of reach with legitimate commercial interests. This is particularly important for public institutions and public funded projects. <coughs> I'm glad that, as Sabitri has already mentioned, the NCERT has taken the initiative of declaring, with some prodding from me, I'll admit, that NROER will carry the CC by SA license. I have been lobbied by Wikimedia and other advocates of open educational resources for this standard to be adopted rather than the CC by SANC, which contains a more restrictive clause. And this decision by NCRT is, of course, in tune with UNESCO's Paris Declaration on Open Education Resources and will ensure that the resources are freely accessible to all. To put it in the language of Creative Commons, to reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. Um, now, like any other significant idea, the Creative Commons movement has generated some criticism. I think we should admit that and face it. Some have argued that it's uh, really a repackaged version of the old copyright regime. This argument suggests that some rights reserve the, the some of the sorry the some rights reserved feature of Creative Commons is not that different from the all rights reserved feature of the old copyright regime. Maybe nitpicking, but that is an argument. Others have argued that the Creative Commons model may well destroy the old copyright regime with disastrous consequences for creators and publishers of content, both online and offline. Uh, I have a son in the audience who is uh, an aspiring novelist, and I think the poor fellow will need to live on what he can earn uh, from, from, from people paying royalties on the books he sells. Um, and, and having had some of my books extensively pirated on the, on the streets of India, uh, I have to admit that, um, that uh, it helped in my case that I wasn't dependent on, on, my, on, my, on my royalties for a livelihood. But for many writers, these are serious, serious concerns. Now, when I give you these two arguments, that it's just really just like the bad old copyright regime on the one hand, and the argument that it will destroy all copyright and creativity on the other, obviously both arguments cannot be valid at the same time. Uh, so if I can don these twin hats of author and policymaker, I think the honest thing to say would be that this is all uncharted territory for all of us. With the Creative Commons license, I have the right to issue certain aspects of my writings or thoughts to the general audience and reserve those that I feel are better off unreleased. So I can put my articles on the web and invite people to, to take them down and use them as they wish, but I may not put an entire book out for free simply because I would simply have no income if the voters decide to return me to the world of literature. Uh, and, and this is the kind of balancing that we may, we, may have to, we may have to accept in some cases. The Internet is testing established conventions in almost every sphere of human activity, and the world of traditional publishing and copyrights is deluded if it thinks it can be insulated from the changes that are sweeping through our society and through all areas of our culture. Let me conclude. I'm afraid this miscommunication Savitri alluded to means that not only am I later here than I'd than you were expecting me to be, but I'm now going to be very late for where I'm supposed to be next. So let me conclude that as, as far as the role of open education resources is concerned, India's education sector stands at the cusp of immense opportunities as we put forward our greatest efforts to create an India of the 21st century, an India of literate and educated people, and an India we hope with immense opportunities for all of you young people here. We cannot ignore or underestimate the power of ICT in realizing our goal. But great things happen only when you prepare yourself for their embrace. We must invest in doing whatever is required to ensure that we don't miss this opportunity. I hope that uh, the launch of the Creative Commons will bring us closer to the goal of creating a more open, more tolerant, and more educated India. It is time to create an India of our dreams. Thank you very much. Congratulations and Jai Hind. Yeah.
Uh, I'm sure Dr. Tharoor's talk makes us feel good that with the government of India believing in open access, we'll have greater success in spreading knowledge far and wide and free through the Creative Commons licenses. And as Dr. Sh uh, Shashi Tharoor has said, he'd like to take a few questions. I Please. can just take a couple of last. I have a 5.30 meeting I can't be late for. Because unfortunately, it's a foreigner and they tend to be punctual, unlike some of us here. Yes, yes. Uh, go ahead. So I am an uh, IT guy who started his career with punch cards. So you started? Sorry, too. I am an IT guy who started his career with punch cards. Punch cards, right? Yes, and uh, right now I'm working on the 50th backward district in Himachal Pradesh in India mm -hmm. on uh, using ICT for learning as well as for creating jobs. Yeah. I was sending work from the U.S. to Gurgaon, etc. Mm -hmm. And I think we can send it from. Why not Nehru Place cannot place this at all through the villages? Mm -hmm. One is we cut down the brain drain from the village to the city. Mm -hmm. Secondly is we don't crowd up the cities with slums. And thirdly is, let's say 4,000 4, 4, rupees in the villages is comfortably worth 20,000 in the cities. Yeah. And it adds to the rural part of it. My question basically happens to be, why are we taking such a long time to change? You see, knowledge is doubling every two years. Yep. Every year we're adding 11 million people. And I think in this entire 10th plan, whatever it is, I don't know, the, the number of jobs created is abysmal. Now, from an HRD perspective, can't we move things faster? <laughs> no, if you can't, then I mean, you're, you're going to finish we're, music. We're, we're trying, to be honest. With you. First of all, let me say that I agree with your premise, your first point about the importance of bringing <coughs> modern, 21st century facilities into our villages so that we don't actually need to see people leave the villages to have access to those facilities. Broadband connectivity to village India, rural India can really make all the difference. I mean, why can't you, you know, if, if somebody is answering uh, some anxious customer in America checking their credit card or their bills, they don't have to be sitting in Gurgaon, they can be sitting in a real gaon. I mean, you know, the, 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 the problem is, 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 is only a question of connectivity, electricity, the basic infrastructural issues. And that's something that I, I, I'm very, very keen on, on seeing happen. And I, I completely share that vision. On why things are moving slowly, I mean, you know, we are talking in a world of Moore's law, uh, but implying it in a world of Murphy's law, where everything that <laughs> can go wrong or can be held up uh, is. Um, Governance is a prospect, of course, of interest, is, is a process of <laughs> reconciling various interests. And that is going to be true, frankly, whoever is in government. What we can do is populate government with people who are impatient and anxious to get things moving. And I'm pleased to say that uh, people like Nandan and myself are in that category. We are trying to push things along as much as they can be pushed. And in this one, as Savitri said, we have been able to get CC by SA done uh, after many years of earlier effort all it took was somebody pushing the door the right way at the right time. So one only comment on what you said is that we've had 10 years of e-governance. In 10 years, at least you should know where the problems are mm -hmm. and where the change management is required. You don't have to take, I happen to have been a CIO, so I understand the problem is not technology. The problem is how do you change the people? More important than the people, how to change the processes. And I noticed that we, all, most of our EGA projects, they've just computerized what was going on, and that also, they've not really computerized. Take land records, it's been done about 20 years back. Today, actually, if you go and you want to produce a computer-based document and take it to the court, the court doesn't accept it. That means your manual system continues. The pay rise, which was given to the fifth uh, commission and whatever else it is, 30% reduction is expected. That's not taking place. So we poor Indians are getting the worst of both sides. We're paying our civil servants more, and the output from them is less. Now, I mean, where does the problem lie? <laughs> and what are, you, what are you people in the government doing? Now the election has come around. I mean, you have to give an account of where you spent think, our uh, money. Thank you. No, no, I, th I, think, I think you've made a very valid point. Frankly, you know, the problem lies in ourselves. This seems to be, I mean, the correct answer is we are like this only. But we need to change. We need to be not like this only. And the fact is that we are trying. Implementation has always been the challenge in our country. And making sure that regulations, rules, laws are updated, keep up with each other. As you, as it was a very, very good example you gave. You computerize land records on the one part, but the judiciary doesn't accept a computerized document. You're back to square one. 
we, we, we do have to change all our systems and we have to, as I said, bring various multifarious interests and institutions along in doing so. And if you are saying that this could have been done better and faster and hasn't been, I don't disagree with you at all. I'm not sure that anyone could have done it better or faster. We are trying and we are pushing. Uh, you had a question. Yeah. There. Uh, good evening, Dr. Tharoor. It's a pleasure to have an opportunity to interact with you here. Thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, I mean, uh, there are two questions which I have and I want your views on that. Now, we are, uh, as you mentioned that the government already has a broadband connectivity plan to connect all the villages and um, mm -hmm. disseminate knowledge on that. Yeah. But uh, um, don't you think that with mobile broadband already being very much available and with Wi-Fi technologies already being available, is it not a faster option to use by incentivizing the private telecom operators as well to move into rural areas and establish their networks there where without having the fiber being connected and without having the logistics challenges to do that, mobile broadband could be a very faster option to get uh, access uh, to the open course, right? You, know, you, mix of, you make a lot of sense to me. I'm just not the policy maker in that. That's okay. Ministry of Information, okay. Technology but, but and but Communication. But I would request if, uh, and, and, you know, I, I can certainly can informally, when I see the ministers next, I can ask whether they considered this and why they didn't go ahead with it. Sure. And just one more question. Like, uh, can uh, we restrict to one question per just, person? Just no, just no. Let's uh, leave it. Uh, he's, he has a question. I mean, I thought I, I made a mistake by allowing him two questions. <laughs> Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Uh, my name is Apoor. And I don't accept anything from government that they do. The, uh, what I do, I believe what I do. Mm -hmm. so, so my question is, the population is increasing day by day. Mm -hmm. So we have to control first that to uh, to properly to properly uh, use resources. We are consuming everything every day. We don't give anything back to the nature. So my question is, if if we'll, the main problem is population, and uh, how if 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 uh, if if a married couple have one child, that will be a good option. So there okay, has to be policy. I mean, we got the question. Yeah, so there has to be policy respond. to control population, and uh, everything will be good if the population is in control. See, but Apura, you began by saying that you believe in what you can do and not in what the government does. Yeah. So <laughs> why do you want the government to start controlling you? Take it. Take it. I don't have any. You should. You it's should enough. exercise. Sufficient self-restraint, if you believe that, and so should others. <laughs> I'll ask, I'll ask but look, one. jokes Let apart, you. the best contraceptive is development. You know, people aren't poor because they have too many children. There are enough studies. They have too many children because they're poor. They're very poor. They're not educated. They see children as an investment for their future. They're a source of support in old age, etc. You'll find that relatively rarely do the affluent have more children because when children survive, uh, they, they don't, uh, they're not vulnerable to illness and disease then they become uh, uh, an asset, as it were, in smaller numbers. And you find that in many, many cases, I mean, I can certainly speak of my own family. Both my uh, parents were one of eight children each. And they had three, and each of the three have two. Well, actually, one has three, but that's not it. I, I have twins, and I stopped with that. So and it just, it just, just happened through the normal processes of development. I would certainly, however, not have wanted the government to tell me not to have that third one. So let's, the government has a policy of encouraging and incentivizing smaller families, but not of stopping them. China tried the one-child policy, and the result now is you have that poor one child supporting four grandparents, and they are an aging society while we are still youthful because we didn't have that kind of draconian policy. In the year uh, 2020, according to the estimate of the ILO, the International Labour Organization, we will have 116 million young people between the ages of 20 and 24 ready to start work, and the Chinese will only have 94 million. If we can educate and train these young people and equip them to take advantage of what the 21st century has to offer, we will do far better than China because we didn't have a one-child policy. Of course, if we don't educate them, then that's another issue. Uh, I'm sure you can take another question. Sir, I'm a marketing student. Uh, I study in IMT Ghaziabad. Uh, I don't know, I have this feeling which, where I believe that the mic. post the 1960s, post Kotler, uh, post commercialization, post uh, greed, uh, is when really we have seen something which is not correct, not right, morally, etc., etc., etc. Now, what I believe is that uh, marketing textbooks, the source of greed, need to be rewritten. What Kotler has been teaching has become outdated. This is a fact. Accepting this 
is I believe the key. Now, uh, let me elaborate further. Uh, Not too much. Not too much. I take two seconds. You've got the question. I, think. I take two. I am actually late for my. Next I take two already. seconds only if you will allow me. Yeah, okay. But he hasn't allowed me. Two seconds, go quickly, but really quick. <laughs> so, future, I am late. Futurity.org is a website which is Ivy League colleges uh, in the United States, uh, UK collaborating. Uh, uh, this is basically them putting their research online. This is very important research which is online and it has something like 7,000 likes on Facebook currently. 7,000 likes currently on Facebook. If it is critical resource and it is knowledge and I have created a viral video to spread this knowledge, what am I expected to do as a creative comment? Put it up on YouTube. I mean, you always have the choice. You see, you can either make it openly accessible and free and people can, I mean, you talked about textbooks. NCRT textbooks are now essentially uh, openly available. Uh, people can do it, no problem, free of charge, and uh, the material can be disseminated. Now, a publisher or a printer may still want to recoup the cost of the ink and the paper and so on, but the intellectual content, the government has already paid for it, so we're not asking any money for it, we're giving it, you see what I'm saying? Now, in your case, you're a private individual, the government hasn't paid you to do what you're doing. If you want to recoup some cost for it, that's up to you. If you feel you can afford to unleash it virally on the world for free, please do so, and the Creative Commons will applaud you. That you'll have to ask them. I'm MHRD, not CC. Okay. okay, one last question if there is a female. I've answered only male so far. If not, I'm going to give up now. Is there yeah? a female hand yeah, up? Yeah, there is a female hand up there at the back. <clears throat> Just get the mic there. Uh, Hello, sir. Hello, ma'am. Uh, sir, I want to uh, put the question in front of you because you are the government, you are from there. I wish I were the government. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> a very small cog yeah, in the but, wheel of the but government. But for us, uh, we, okay, we value ahead. you. Ask the question. And ma'am, because she is from Delhi University, a principal of a college, I have done post-graduation in pharmacy, uh, in pharmaceutical chemistry, and I thought to design some new compounds for epilepsy. I really wanted to put my effort because I am putting two years into it. But I couldn't because I had a lot of problem in extracting the journals. I could not. I mean, I had very few, three or four, and uh, they were just like prototype. So uh, let's not talk about gowns and villages. Let's talk about Delhi, which is so famous all over the world. India, OK, Delhi will go. Delhi is so famous. Delhi is the city. And in Delhi, Delhi University is so famous. So can we have the journals free? at least in Delhi University, because many people they say, Delhi University, wow. So at least in Delhi University, can we have the free journals, access to them? Let's, matlab, going to the Gauss paperwork, I know the process is slow, but at least in Delhi University, we can have. I think we'll have to look into that, because Delhi University will have to look into that. They're paying a subscription for these publications, and they those subscriptions uh, and access to publications come with certain riders, right? But they are accessible to all Delhi University students and all faculty. Free of charge. Free of charge. Then what's the issue? She is not from Delhi University. Or if she is, then she can enter the intranet. All journals that Delhi University pays for, you have free access. You only have to know the password and you can take it from any university. So what you could do is if you're a Delhi University student, you can get it. Uh, otherwise, get a friend at Delhi University to give you the password. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> That's a great advantage of uh, the yeah. internet. Thank you all very much. It's been a great pleasure. Uh, uh, a small token of our gratitude for taking time out to come. And this was a plant I was supposed to welcome you with. So welcome didn't happen in that way. Oh. Very nice. So we have an entrepreneurship cell. Yes. Okay. Oh, I thought it said candy. <laughs> Andy. 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 All right. Thank you all very much. Congratulations. Where have I put my paper? I now invite uh, Ma'am Rohini Nilekini. Uh, she is the chairperson of Pratham Books, and Pratham Books has been publishing in a public domain for a very long time. 
and I am glad that she could take time out to come. I would like to welcome her with a planter. And she will speak on Creative Commons and Pratham Books case study. Sabko Namaskar. I know how it feels to come in as a batsman after Sachin Tendulkar has hit a century. So uh, bear with me on that. Uh, between Lawrence and Shashi, they have really delineated the framework under which the Creative Commons license is working around the globe. And I am happy to share with you uh, the application which has been made possible because the CC license exists. And I can tell you that we are very, very proud to be partnering the CC domain in this. And let me share with you the miracles that can happen when you open up knowledge uh, into the commons, when you, when you realize that um, when knowledge is shared, it only expands and creates more benefit. So Pratham Books came out of the Pratham Network. We started in 2004, a full 10 years ago on Jan 1, with the idea that, no, that's okay, with the idea that children need a lot of content to read. This is a nation of stories and of storytellers, but you will be surprised to find that even grandmothers are not there to tell stories to children anymore. And it was Einstein who said, if you ask me, what do you need to do to grow intelligence in the world? Create stories, tell stories, let stories flourish. I'm paraphrasing his quote, but it's very clear that stories and the magic that stories hold are very much part of the joy of childhood, and I believe an entitlement that children should have. All of us grew up with great books, great stories. We cannot separate the joy of our childhood from stories, but there are more than 200 million children in this country who today do not have a book to read in any language at all. Some, because we have succeeded in enrolling children, they might have a textbook, but nothing that they can curl up with because try curling up with one of our textbooks. So the problem before us in Pratham Books was through the, through the work of governments and many NGOs, we had produced a lot of new young readers, but they had nothing to practice their newfound reading skills on. Anywhere we went to look at all the content produced in this country, there was not more than five or six hundred books available for children in any language. And to give you a comparison, a country like the United Kingdom, even today, produces six books per child every single year. Whereas in India, we produce most of our books in only two languages, English and Hindi, and we produce less than one book for every 20 kids. And most of those books are read by only a certain elite section of our, of our children. So, so this was the problem we were faced with, that we wanted a book in every child's hand. And how on earth can a non-profit publisher that began so small, not knowing the first thing about publishing in 2004, how could we live up to our vision of saying we want a book in every child's hand? Well, we were very clear that we could not do this on our own. No single organization can do this on its own, not even the largest publisher in the world. And we soon realized that it was not also going to be possible to get physical books into the hands of children. All of you here are students, some of you are scholars, academics. You are talking about getting journals. You are talking about getting academic material into the open source. But think that even children's books in the country of the Ramayana and the Mahabharat, even that is not available to our children today. So we realized that physical books, to get physical books, we, once a child can read, they can read dozens of books very, very quickly and certainly much faster than it takes to produce them. So the only way we were going to crack this was to look at future technology, to future-proof ourselves and to go digital and more than that, to create a vast table of writers, a vast table of illustrators, a lot of people who shared in the societal mission of a book in every child's hand if we were going to succeed. So very quickly we understood that if we tried to gatekeep our content, we were not going to be able to live up to our mission of getting a book into every child's hand. And Gautam John and some of my colleagues, I think Gautam is here somewhere, we said, how do we open this up? And luckily, because CC existed, we were able to say we will take our books, put them online, give them free to the world, allow people the joy of remixing, retelling, reproducing, even selling our work. 
because our goal was not the first bottom line, which is to recover our financial profit, but the second bottom line, which is the social bottom line, which is to get books into the hands of children, to get stories into the hands of children, to get written, written stories, text, into the hand of children. Because in today's day and age, it's not enough to empower children by letting them listen to stories. Though of course, we have a very rich oral tradition of stories, but to make sure that they get to read them because it is the written text that is actually very empowering in a society so much driven by words and content that is written. So let me share the success of that. Once we had put our books out onto the Creative Commons platform and said, here it is, it's on www.prathambooks.org. Let me tell you that we have been told that in all the world, Pratham Books is one of the organizations that has put out the most free content for children. To give you some statistics, we have produced about 270 original titles, which because we translate them into up to 12 languages, we have more than 1,700 books out there for children. Full, more than one-fifth of those, that is about 55 unique titles with 469 translated titles are out on the Creative Commons and in more than 12 languages. And what happens, the miracle of what happens when you put things out on CC, because everyone can use it as they will. People from around the world have been using our stories. Our stories have been translated into languages such as French and Spanish and Chinese. And this is all done if sometimes we get to know about what's happening. That's the beauty of it. It's gone so viral. We don't even know what's happening. By chance, lucky people, uh, some people, decide to share with us what they have done with our work and we get to know. But we even discovered that there is a language called Lodgeman, which is an internet created, internet language into which some of our work has been translated. How does this happen? This happens because like us, there are millions of people around the globe who want children to have good stories, who understand the foundational importance of giving children stories, giving children the joy of childhood. And they take our work, they translate it, they share it with others, and that's how from one story written by one author, you can get a number of stories shared around the world. The power of creative collaboration and the power of collaborative creation is what we rely on. And I think the CC platform really gives us a chance to do that. We could not possibly, with our supply networks, with our distribution networks, with the kind of overheads that are built into the entire publishing and distribution business, there is no way we could have reached the kind of numbers that I'm going to read out to you. I think they were all made possible because CC exists. So as I told you, we have our own 12 languages into which we might be producing a book. But in addition to that, we have Chinese, Spanish, Lodgeman, French, Bordeaux, even Sanskrit. A book that I myself have written under the pseudonym Noni that I write called Annual Haircut Day. We suddenly got a picture. Of, it's a funny book. And then we got this picture of this Sanskrit uh, 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 an, uh, an organization that promotes Sanskrit that translated the book into Sanskrit. And there was this photograph with seven eight swamis holding up this book, which is actually quite a funny book, very solemnly, and it's called Idam Kesha Kartanam Dinam, or something like that. And it really gives us great joy when we hear stuff like that. A Canadian teacher took one of our books at Pratham Books, removed all the very uh, contextual things which would not make any sense to Canadian French children, and convert it into a truly international book with minimal illustrations, translated into French. It became a very delightful book that she says that her class thoroughly enjoys. So, as I told you, all these titles out there, so eight new languages and counting, 6.3 lakh reads on script, 2 lakh downloads on all the various applications that our books have gone onto. They're on mobile phones. They're embedded in the one laptop per child program that has gone into Nepal and Africa. When, when Akash tablets come along, our books will be embedded in the Akash tablets. We have 6.3 lakh page views on the International Children's Digital Library website. 24,000 times children have heard our books on SoundCloud. And that reminds me that I was very happy to be part of the process by which Rahul Cherian, who unfortunately passed away recently from Inclusive Planet, 
and his total devotion to the idea of putting knowledge in the commons. And because of their tireless work, we were able to sign the Marrakesh Treaty, which allows visually impaired people to bypass all copyrights and get access to all material. So hats off to Rahul and his work. Uh, it reminded me when I heard, said sound cloud because those are our audio books. So we've done also the same, the same spirit, the same human spirit, the same human spirit of sharing and caring, which allows this movement to thrive, also tells us that we can always rely on the goodwill of people. What we do is, because we have all this online stuff and our children don't necessarily have access to digital devices on which they can get it, we do a lot of offline events. And Pratham Books has champions all around this country which help us. So we send them a book, um, they take it or they download it or they print it, and then they bring children from the slums or nearby villages and do storytelling sessions with them. We have an annual day on which our champions take some of these books, many of the, all of them usually from our Creative Commons licensed uh, titles. And we have had more than 50,000 children read a story on a single day across all 28 states and two union territories. This is the power of collaboration. This is the power of sharing. And to understand that, as Linus Torvald said, and I'm sure you've all heard that, with with so many eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. What happens is when we translate something or somebody else translates it, there's a whole group of people that can check on those translations, correct them, and sooner or later we get better and better and better content for children. Um, I think encouraging this movement is extraordinarily important in India. We're a nation of diverse stories that cannot be damned. We must open them out even further. So I would urge all of you, look at the Pratham Books website, pick up a story, take it to a child who doesn't have a book to read. And I'm sure all of you have nieces, nephews, siblings, neighbors who need stories, who need to fire up their imaginations. Take those stories to them, share them, write a story for us. It's all out there for you to collaborate with us for the sake of our 200 million children. And even more than that, I think with the kind of hybrid model that Pratham Books has shown, which is part market, part collaboration with the state, part collaboration with the community, I think we have shown that by using multiple forces in society. After all, as an author, as Shashi also was saying, it's not that I might not want to earn anything from my writing. I've written books too. And I'm not sure that I want to put everything up without getting some form of revenue. But I've heard so many writers and illustrators tell us that once we had put some of our given you Pratham books, some of our books free, some of our illustrations free, in fact, uh, the demand for our paid work grew. So all these models, I believe, in the 21st century can coexist. We should not be afraid of giving things free, of opening up our talent and our creativity to be shared. So all of those in you who have entrepreneurial instincts, go out there and create an enterprise that is built out of the CC model. And that's how we are going to make all of our knowledge come together to make good things happen. All of us know what we need to be, do in this country. I think this serves for a great creative platform to share and expand the bounty of our creativity. So I leave it with that. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, will you take a few questions? Sure. A few que any questions, please? Yeah. Uh, the mic there, please. Who has the mic? Uh, push it up, the button. No, there's a button in the middle. Yeah, first of all, I would like to say that it's another century after Sachin Tendulkar's batting. <laughs> right? And the kind second of. thing is, uh, second thing is, like, you talked about Pratham books, and you said that, you know, most of your books are available under Creative Commons license. Yes, I just want to know whether these books are available 
on uh, National Repository of Open Educational Resources because Dr. Shashi Tharu talked about that. And when we say that it's a National Repository of Open Educational Resources, we expect you know, a lot of resources which are you know, openly licensed to be available on that uh, repository. So I just wanted to know like, uh, your view, whether like, you people are there. We are most happy to put them anywhere where they are required because our goal is to reach as many children as we can and that is our only goal. NCRT has come out with a recommended list and for various reasons our books have not found too much of a place on it. We can take the discussion offline but I do hope that we, wherever there are open repositories, because our, our books are for younger children but they are foundational because how does a child learn to read? Once you, once you get immersed in a good story, there is no turning back. Your reading foundation is set and that you cannot unlearn reading, I believe. So uh, the reason, wherever possible, we want our books out there. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, the reason why I asked this question, because I feel that a lot of teachers, they are accessing NROER. And we feel that you know, they should also have access to these books. I right? completely these books agree are with you. I couldn't agree books, more. Good books. So it should be there on that. Thank and you. And in fact, I was coordinating that at National Repository of Open Education Resources Project. So I'll take this back to office and we'll discuss this particular thing and sure. see that, you know, some of the good open educational resources are there on the repository. Thank you. And in fact, to all the people out here, I mean, who are listening and who are part of this discussion, you know, we are organizing a lot of events on National Repository of Open Education Resources and we would like all of you to be a part of it. Please visit our website, that is noer.gov.in and we need a support from all the teachers, all the students, because that is the platform wherein we uh, not only access the content, but also create the content. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other question? So we are building out a whole new digital platform now, which will be also mobile enabled, so that literally people, we can create this whole an ecosystem of writers and illustrators um, and actually be able to make a book a written story available in a child's hand anywhere and anytime. And you will see that being built out over the next few months. Excuse me. Question there. Yeah. Hi. Uh, professionally, I'm a media consultant, but I'm attached socially with several organizations who are doing community service. Right now, I'm, I'm uh, president of a Rotary Club. Uh, I just want to ask that uh, do Pratham books uh, invite people uh, from the common, you can say common people or the children from the schools? Uh, they can uh, write stories and send to you and you can publish in their name only because we do oh, keep absolutely. on organizing some sort of story writing competitions etc. Uh, fortunately I was part of uh, a team with Dr. Kalam also when uh, he started at Vision What Can yes. I Give. Then we launched a, a storytelling competition on uh, giving things right. that uh, one can give smile or one can give something else. So do you, uh, 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 are you open for this thing if people write something, no, if absolutely. kids write something? Actually, we've built the largest, uh, largest group of children's writers in this country. And we are open to many more good books to be written by anybody. I think there's a writer in many of us. And we're open to that. Of course, there's an editorial process yeah. because there are some quality issues. Yeah. But even that we are going to open up because in the new digital platform it will be uh, a, a kind of a of space where all kinds of people will be able to write and since the books are not going to be physically printed it really doesn't matter we will match readers to writers and completely break this thing open. This is great because uh, when we organize some sort of competitions, we cannot uh, uh, award every kid, I every understand. participant. Yes. But this will be an incentivizing model for them that sure. your story will, uh, if selected, no, that exactly can be what published. You, that's exactly what so we are much. aiming yeah, to do. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, one there. hand there. Sure. Yeah. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, first of all, I would like to thank you uh, as a publishing for creating a publishing company which concentrates on the social bottom line instead of the profit one. Uh, now I'm a 14-year-old aspiring author, and uh, yeah, now I've already uh, written a lot of stories and I'm compiling everything. Now suppose if I were have to take any part or section of a chapter of any book on the site of Pratham Books, so. Under that jurisdiction, would I be allowed to refer in my book 
do that series of scenario in that book? Absolutely. We have put our books on a CCBY license and where is Gautam? If there's any technical question, I rely on Gautam John to answer it for me. But I, I see no reason why you can't put some of our content into one of your stories. We do ask for... Um, we do ask for attribution, so somewhere right at the end where you say this book is written by me, you can also say some of this content is taken from Pratham books. And the reason for that is so that many more people know that there is Pratham books content available for use. The funny thing is that actually Flipkart and other agencies sell our books. So uh, it's good to know that there is a market for our books also. So they sell our books and they get the profit, but I am happy because that means one more child somewhere got one more book. Thank you. Is there any question? Okay. Last question. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, it's really nice to know the initiative uh, which Pratham Books has taken and uh, opening up uh, for the uh, stories for the children, and which is very good. And I would also want to associate myself in whatever way I can with Pratham Books. Uh, ma'am, I wanted to know, like, uh, seeing from the use of the books, do you still feel that Panchatantra, the our ancient stories, is still a very uh, good, uh, I mean, a medium for our children? I mean, they are. The children of today are using that on Pratham Books website. Yeah. Is that still being a, um, a good one? Actually, we did some we did some research, and actually, even today, the books from the the stories of the Panchatantra are very widely published all across India and very widely read all across India. Our goal was to bring modern. Uh, newly written indigenous content yeah, into this space, yeah, written yeah, by yeah, Indians yeah. for Indian yeah, children yeah, in yeah, Indian yeah, languages. Yeah. So a lot of our focus has yeah, been to get yeah, modern, yeah. relevant, yeah. contextual, yeah. diverse yeah. content. So, yeah. for example, some of our new content is tribal uh, in origin, and we are taking tribal children's stories out for non-tribal children, and also taking other stories and making sure that tribal children get to read them because we need to have this confluence of cultures in our country and I think stories travel fastest across cultural barriers. Yeah? Okay? Yeah. Thank okay, you very uh, much. Do visit us at prathambooks.org. Write, read, share. Thank you very much. Okay. So Rohini shared a great example of application of the open culture. And we'd like to thank her with a small token. Oh, you want me to give it? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, may I now invite one of the affiliate partners of the CC India, Moksh Janeja, who is the president of the executive committee Wikimedia India chapter. And he will speak on Creative Commons and Wikipedia. Keep it short. On the screen, yeah. uh, screen please, and lights dimmed. Till the screen comes up. So this is a quote by Jimmy Wales. Imagine a world in which every single person on this planet is given free access to the sum of all human knowledge. That's what we are doing. And to make this point come across even more clearer, at Wikipedia, what has been the clear motto is to collect the wisdom of the crowds and to give it back to them. So how is this possible? We have around 285 languages on Wikipedia, 43 Indian languages that have, have articles written there that's beyond the English Wikipedia. In English Wikipedia itself, there are around 4 million articles, out of which 1.5 million articles are based on India. So just to give you a little background on Wikipedia itself, Wikipedia is based on five pillars. Wikipedia, as you all know, is an encyclopedia. Second, Wikipedia has a neutral point of view. You cannot give your opinions. You cannot, you have to state facts. If you're giving a particular point of view, it has to be attributed 
to a third party uh, and most importantly it has to be attributed to a press or a media uh, article and the foremost important pillar for this particular occasion is Wikipedia is free content that anyone can use modify and distribute as students you have copy pasted Wikipedia pages into your projects yes no okay so so that's exactly what happens so so you don't need to attribute there but what you would have ideally attributed is not just the Wikipedia page but you should have attributed to those list of references or citations that are given below and that is what Creative Commons is all about and that is why the three organizations have come together for this so very clearly Wikipedia uses CC by SA what does that mean very clearly Wikipedia any article written on Wikipedia can be shared modified and distributed at the same time the only clause for this is that you need to give an attribution without an attribution it won't make sense because if you have lifted a particular content or an image or a video from Wikipedia itself it would not have that credibility <coughs> At the same time, you must all be aware that Wikipedia has a lot of content that you can use. But also, please remember, Wikipedia Commons has a lot of images that you can use. There are a lot of music that you can use. There are a lot of short movies that you can use also. And that can all be as part of your project, which actually gives a multimedia dimension to your projects too. So citing some more examples, as to what are the other institutes that have done to actually get CC by SA and they're actually using it right now. This is from the National Archives in the US, Jimmy Carter in India. Now if you try and source this kind of an image from our like Press Information Bureau or if you're going to be using a Times of India or any other media outlet, you'll have to give an attribution there. But this, you can use it. But if you're going to be using a media outlet, you will either have to seek permission or you'll have to pay for this image or content. This is the Russian Kremlin, which has actually authorized to use uh, the Kremlin materials under CC by SA. This is a Gorkha regiment, which is actually practicing during World War I. And this has been actually opened up by the British Library. Now, the same image we cannot find in the public domain. And that is the sad state of affairs currently right now. But if we do have this information with us, the number of articles on Wikipedia, the number of information and content and access to knowledge automatically becomes much, much higher. This is a Sofia Zoo in Bulgaria. Now, if you see very clearly, you can see a particular QR code in one of those images. Now, how they, have or how they have actually provided access is you can actually scan the QR code and you directly link it up to the Wikipedia article of the animal that is found in. So it's not just, just providing information, it's actually making information more interactive, more usable, more friendlier for people to get information. <coughs> and our own and ROER, I, think, I believe everybody has spoken enough of this, but I would definitely highly recommend this space, even though it may not have a lot of information right now and it's collecting a lot of information right now. But if you search the word Gandhi, you will automatically find a lot of different permutation co uh, you know, combinations of the word Gandhi. So you, of course, will have Mahatma Gandhi, then you'll have Gandhi with leaders, then you'll have Gandhi in a particular movement that he had you know propagated at that time and that same information before this website was again not available for the public domain why are we championing this because as of now at Wikipedia itself we just have one and a half lakh English you know Wikipedia articles written what we really want is the number to go up so that people can actually have information that is more accessible to everyone at the same time, let me give you some more examples and an appeal if someone is sitting here from these organizations. A census data is a copyright data. Now all of us are paying information or paying 
through our taxes for these government agencies for the census data itself but what are we getting a copyright document which is probably not even accessed by all but as of now if we just had this data accessible right now we would know the names of six and a half lakh villages that are existing in India right now another example ISRO is written but I'll give you an example of NASA NASA is funded by the government and whatever information or the images that they have on their website can be reused ISRO doesn't do that it is copyrighted with them and this is an actual conversation which I was having with the communications person at ISRO on an email and the communication actually was why don't you release it under the Creative Commons license and he tells me it's available on the website please use it from there so you know that is the awareness that we need to actually go as individuals go out there and take this further and say that listen we need to whatever we are creating individually or as representatives of the government give it back PIB data that is the press information bureau now press information bureau is has a lot of these information about our history about our current scenario why don't we release it there an example of Indra Gandhi's Wikipedia page we are using a, a particular photograph on that page from the British Library of Indra Gandhi we do not have a, a, a image of Indra Gandhi which is open to the public domain right now what we really need is that information and I'm not just saying about Wikipedia I'm saying Wikipedia is one of the tools that is actually going out there why not make you know the whole set of information that can be used in the public domain through Creative Commons and that's my appeal to you thank you Okay, uh, please bring that token gift that we are giving to each of our speakers. And though Moksha is a member of the team, he still deserves this because he came and presented his view, the organization's view on Creative Commons, use of Creative Commons licenses. And at this moment, uh, on behalf of Wikimedia India, Achar Narendip College, and the Center for Internet and Society, I'd like to thank you all for your patience and I hope many of you will be our torchbearers for the Creative Commons license and if any of you want any kind of workshops to be held or want to discuss this further please do go to the CC India page and you can contact us our contact addresses are there and we'll be very glad to come down to your organizations if necessary or if for you to come to us and learn, understand and maybe work together to take Creative Commons forward in India. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now uh, I request you all to join us for a cup of tea downstairs. I mean, it's not downstairs, it's down the stairs twice over. It's in the basement. Thank you very much.